The 2018 Armenian Velvet Revolution saw a massive tectonic shift in Armenian politics. Five years have passed since that revolution, and obviously we are still trying to assess, you know, what does that mean? What did that event mean for the country of Armenia and for Armenian peoples, both in Armenia and worldwide? To discuss this, I'm joined by Nerses Kopalyan, the Professor of Political Science at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So, Professor, thanks again for your time. Thank you for having me. So, I mentioned it's five years that have passed since the 2018 Velvet Revolution. In your opinion, what brought about that massive change? And also, did the causes for the revolution appear to have been appeased, in your opinion? Have some been appeased or have some not? So, I mean, there's, there's a trend, you know, we saw uh, in the last 15 years with some certain levels of what we call democratic breakthroughs in Russia's authoritarian orbit. Uh, Georgia started this with the Rose Revolution, Ukraine is at this twice with the Orange Revolution and Euromaidan, and then uh, Armenia was sort of the last one. Even at a tulip revolution in Kyrgyzstan, so what we what happened with Armenia was not out of the ordinary from the lens of political science. Uh, but the cause of the velvet again were very similar to what we saw in Georgia and um, in Ukraine. It was sort of a collective Collective uh, public thing, uh, a response against years of endemic corruption, underdevelopment, patronalism, uh, all these things that we've all gotten used to, especially when it came to um, sort of disparity in uh, wealth um, and disenfranchisement of society and a lot of the abuse of power that we saw with the previous authorities. So, you, you know, there was a sort of this trend uh, that uh, the region had and uh, Armenia uh, crystallized those developments by 2018. So the causes have been very, very straightforward. But the way it happened in Armenia was relatively unique because uh, Armenia was the only democratic breakthrough that we've had in a post-Soviet space where the movement was not led by anybody from government or anybody that had left government. It was intrinsic outside of government structures. It was civic society and the uh, opposition. So with Georgia, for example, uh, Saakashvili was the uh, previous uh, minister of justice who mm -hmm. broke up and then did what he did. Uh, in Ukraine, again, um, the opposition was at one point part of the government and then it broke off and uh, led the movement. Armenia was distinct in this context. It was uh, inherently a, a very grassroots uh, <clears throat> civil society led bottom up movement. And so those configurations are very important to understand the distinction between Armenia's Velvet Revolution and the other democratic breakthroughs that uh, happened uh, in the post Soviet space. With respect to expectations, you know. Um, Generally speaking, obviously, when you have mass uh, uh, public uprisings, there's a sort of inherent euphoria that shapes developments and expectations are always going to exceed reality. That comes with, uh, with sort of, you know, collective human behavior. Um, but uh, generally speaking, you had two uh, very important developments that kind of created serious obstacles to uh, the velvet achieving its objectives, or at least the objective slowing down. Uh, COVID, of course, played a big role in the 2020 war. So one could argue that Armenia made a democratic breakthrough, but we have not obviously consolidated, nor are we anywhere close to consolidating the democracy. So we are in a process, what we call in the, in the scholarship thing, a transitology. We're in the process of sort of transitioning and attempting to consolidate. Uh, in that context, um, you know, what is happening to Armenia is not really distinct from much of the other comparative uh, studies that we have. Georgia, after 20 years, has not consolidated. Um, Ukraine, again, had a very large hiccup, one could say, right, in a sort of an anecdotal sense, with a Russian invasion. So that's going to slow down their democratization process uh, for, for X amount of years. Uh, consolidation is going to take a very long time. So when we look at through a sort of a, both a geopolitical, uh, regional, and even in a d domestic developmental sense, uh, we have to understand that uh, a democratic breakthrough doesn't mean an automatic consolidation. Mm -hmm. So Armenia is through going through the transitology process. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting that you also mentioned Georgia and Ukraine. Um, the people from the ruling party, for example, that we've spoken to were quite keen to, to explain that uh, the revolution in Armenia wasn't a color revolution in the sense that it was in, in, in Georgia and, and Ukraine. Lenan Nazarian, a prominent figure in the ruling party, said that the only flags being flown at the revolution were Armenian flags, not EU flags or NATO flags, for example. Um, 
However, people who oppose、uh, the revolution, some people who have been critical, do describe it as something that、uh, upset the geopolitical architecture in, in the region. So I'm wondering what you think about these two narratives: this, this、uh, coining the term "color revolution" when it comes to the velvet.、Um, my good friend Anna Huanyan、uh, coined the term that you know, velvet is not a color. And so,、uh, in the scholarship, we don't qualify the velvet revolution as a color revolution because it had no geopolitical implications.、Uh, the objective of the movement was not led by geopolitical grievances, but rather by domestic grievances, and that's very, very important to、uh, separate.、Uh, Georgia's, for example, was led by、uh, geopolitical grievances when Saakashvili came out as adamantly anti-Russia. Entirely, the Ukraine movement was inherently anti-Russian. Uh, Armenia's、uh, velvet was specifically driven by what the、uh, Sarkisian government regime did, with basically him、um, violating his promise, assuming the prime ministership, and that exploded sort of you know、uh, the activism of civic society and, and rest of the Armenian population. So these are two different、uh, configurations.、Um, there was not anything geopolitical that triggered or mobilized uh, uh, the, the uh, mass uprising that led to the velvet. So it's very important to. Uh, gauge those developments, and so in that context,、um, there were no initially geopolitical of variables. There's no empirical evidence to support that argument. One may engage in sort of you know unsubstantiated speculation, which is quite common among public pundits. But from the lens of scholarship, there's no evidence to support that. Now, the other argument, of course, is did it eventually become or develop a geopolitical、uh, color to it or component to it? Well, that's inevitable, right? If you're trying to democratize an authoritarian orbit and you're surrounded by authoritarian Authoritarian interests, then inevitably there's going to be a, some level of thing a clash of values. But until 2020, even a year after uh, uh, the 2020 war, Armenia's、uh, foreign policy alliance remained very, very consistent with Russia. So there's no evidence to suggest that from 2018 until. 2021, that there was in any way a rupture in Armenia's foreign policy posturing, that that in of itself negates the whole argument that the velvet was a geopolitical、uh, movement, which it wasn't. It had no geopolitical configurations. But of course,、uh, by late 2022,、uh, especially what we saw in September with the、uh, Azerbaijani mass invasion into into Jermuk into the Gagarinic region, this altered the dynamics. And so Armenia's current pivot is a byproduct of those developments. There was no pivot in 2018.、Uh, our foreign policy remained consistent with the foreign policies of previous regimes. This is why it's very hard for anybody to argue, based on the extant data, that there was any kind of a,、uh, a color component, quote unquote, color component to the velvet. And do you think it's possible to separate the Pashinyan government from the 2018 Velvet Revolution? Can one, let's say, oppose the policies and government of Pashinyan today and yet applaud the revolution? Absolutely.、Um, you know, we have two problems at this point because we don't have a, a legitimate democratic opposition.、Uh, Armenian society equates whatever modality of democracy we have with the current government, and therefore it remains a representative of the velvet values. But once Armenia develops、uh, intrinsically, organically,、uh, a democratic opposition, this dynamic, this discourse is going to change. But since 2018, the only opposition you had has been sort of the non-democratic, illiberal opposition comprised of what we call the authoritarian vestiges, those that are remnants of the previous regime. And so between sort of that dichotomous Structuring that we had in the electoral field, inevitably a society automatically equates the current government as representative of the velvet values. But、uh, if we look at the the broader、uh, makeup of Armenian society, not just simply in the electoral field, but also in the various、uh, realms where you see political participation, you see a very very vibrant civic society. And I'm one of those that argues that civic society in Armenia actually serves as a healthy opposition, even though they are not in the electoral field.、Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, in that context, those who are part of civic society but are not part of government are also representatives of the velvet thing of、uh, values and the entire movement. But they 
simply owning government. So the Velvet was a societal-wide movement, right? It was a watershed mo movement in Armenian history. Uh, the current government represents it as sort of, you know, the, the, the ones who held the mantle and institutionalized it with respect to taking power. But as a cultural movement, as a socio-political movement, the government does not have a monopoly on the values of the Velvet. So I think those are very, very important distinctions to make. So uh, just because someone, for example, criticizes the pension policies of the government, for example, or taxing policies of foreign government, or even the military reform processes, it doesn't mean the, the, uh, the criticism is intrinsically anti-Velvet. Of course not. Uh, the issue is who's doing the criticizing. Whenever civic society or those who promote democracy or democratic values criticize the government, you don't see any uh, pushback on that from the rest of society. But when those who criticize it, who for decades were part of the previous regime, and now basically are utilizing the instruments of democracy to basically weaken democracy, this is where you see a backlash against those kinds of sort of, one could say intellectually dishonest criticisms. So uh, in of itself, uh, engaging in criticism does not qualify uh, uh, something that's problematic. It's a question of who's criticizing it and, and the, the basis of the criticism. Okay, and I mean, there's the old ad adage that it takes a revolution to make a change, but revolutionaries hardly can govern well. What do you think about this narrative that, you know, there is always a sense of incompetence when the political class is turned over on its head? Well, I mean, I mean, Armenia has a healthy tradition of incompetent governance. Um, you know, authoritarianism, corruption, systemic, uh, uh, chronic underdevelopment doesn't suggest in any modality of, of governance as well. It's just that modality of governance allows for functionality for that system uh, of elites. And then you have the, the velvet where Armenian society has no tradition. Armenian bureaucracies do not have any tradition of uh, well-developed uh, middle management when it comes to bureaucratic activities. You have no tradition of, of producing civic servants that could uh, uh, something, uh, fulfill the tax, uh, uh, excuse me, the task of governance. And so in that context, of course, you had those who took over government represent the will of the people with very little experience in governance. But the modality of governance was also different. You went from an authoritarian or a, what we call a rigid hybrid regime governance to a democratic governance. And so the shift in the structuration is inev inevitably going to create problems. Mm. Um, when it comes to the question of competence, uh, we have to understand that uh, underdeveloped societies or societies that are in the process of developing, where you have chronic uh, institutional limitations, where you have the legacy of Soviet institutions that are generally dysfunctional and prone and conducive to, to, to a systemic corruption, uh, governing, you, you could be a superb uh, uh, in the thing, have a superb skill set in management and governance. Even if you bring those with that level of capacity to govern basically a relatively rotten system, the outcome is going to be inherently problematic. Um, so this is we have to have a very healthy assessment of this. But did the, uh, did the uh, post-Velvet government have uh, a sufficient experience to govern? Of course not. Were errors made? Inevitably. Were these, do these errors continue to be made? Of course. Right. There, there, every government, uh, every, every uh, leadership has these sort of set of problems. But the fact of the matter is, Armenian society continuously, through the electoral process, selects a certain political party, a certain leadership to, to run, and that is the will of the people. And so questioning the legitimacy and questioning performance are two different things. And I think our political culture hasn't sufficiently evolved for us to be able to draw that distinction. So you may question the errors of this government, but based on these errors, you cannot proceed to question the legitimacy of the government because then you're questioning the legitimacy of the will of the people, and that is inherently problematic. And there are those that would say that it was the post-revolution government's decision-making approach to diplomacy that was one of the factors that led to the 2020 Karabakh war. Um, others might say that the 2020 Karabakh war was perhaps, a, in a sense, a punishment for the revolution. What do you think about those two narratives? Both are, I'm going to be very careful with my words, uh, both are obviously underdeveloped uh, and sort of, you know, one could say analytically infantile arguments that are inherently politicized and devoid of any uh, evidence based on, on, you know, scholarship or the empirical data that we have. Um, Azerbaijan had certain expectations from Armenia. We still don't know the state of negotiations that existed between our, uh, Aliyev regime and the Sarkisian regime. And so those dynamics would be unraveled down the line. 
Uh, so when it comes to those expectations, we didn't know developments. Second, if we're arguing that Russia, Armenia's so-called security guarantor, tacitly allowed the 2020 war to proceed the way that it did, then now you're engaging in sort of various forms of uh, arguments, and you're basically saying Russia continues to work against uh, Armenia it, it, with the hopes that this government or the velvet government will collapse, because that would be the prevailing logic, right, uh, if we're going to proceed with one of those analytical mm -hmm. frameworks. But fundamentally, that is a very oversimplified assessment of an a very inherently complex uh, situation. You had a severe power disparity between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan had been investing in its military, arming its military for the last 12 years. At a, at a proportion where Armenia could not even catch up if we began investing in the same magnitude as they had. So when your enemy is arming itself to the teeth, spending a couple of billion dollars a year, it's simply a matter of time that they're going to utilize those things, weaponry. They're not doing that simply to project power. So the, the risk and probability of another war breaking out was a matter of time. It wasn't a question of if, it was a question of when. Um, so in that context, if you understand, if one understands the sort of, you know, the notion of relative power and, and, and any disbalance in the uh, regional uh, power symmetries, the conduciveness of war became very, very high. And so there was that component to consider. Uh, with respect to diplomacy, again, Armenia's diplomacy did not shift. It maintained and towed the Russian line even after uh, 2018 and all the way to 2020. There were no ruptures. There's no evidence or data to suggest that Armenia's foreign policy ruptured or separated from the Russian line. So in that context, the whole notion of a punishment, again, it's a rhetoric, but there's simply no evidence to support it. Um, now, the reverse discourse may be that Russia simply doesn't care if you toe the line. If you democratize, they're going to work against you. In that context, the argument is then Armenia should be perpetually underdeveloped and undemocratic because we don't want to upset anyone. Therefore, the will of the Armenian people is secondary and you should continue existing the way you have existed. Well, that is not a sustainable or tenable argument. And so whatever modality of argument that's presented, we have to understand that, yes, there were errors uh, by this government that produced certain outcomes. But at the same time, what we saw from 2016, the four-day war, that was a very, very important indicator that suggested it doesn't matter the type of government Armenia has or the leadership that it has. Azerbaijan already had its set objectives, understandably so, for its own strategic interests, and it was going to proceed accordingly. So whatever excuses that are produced or explanations that are produced, they are not embedded in scholarship or, or data or evidence. These are mostly based on sort of, you know, empty rhetoric that's very, very common among our pundits. Okay, well, Professor, insightful, insightful as always. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us on Civil Now.